Welcome to the Did Oliver Cowdery Write the Book of Mormon video. Okay, Larry E. Morris in the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies said, Clearly, it is no exaggeration to call Oliver Cowdery the co-founder of Mormonism. Okay, E.D. Howe, Mormonism Unveiled, the famous book which came out in 1834, that there has been from the beginning of the imposture a more talented knave behind the curtain is evident to our mind. So an imposture is just a deception. And he's say, saying there's somebody more talented than Joseph Smith behind the curtain. Okay, Judge William Lang to Thomas Gregg in 1881. Uh, Judge William Lang was a partner of Oliver Cowdery in his law firm. And he's talking about the question, did Oliver Cowdery ever openly denounce Mormonism? And then he says, no man ever knew better than he how to keep one's own counsel. In other words, <clears throat> nobody knew better than Oliver Cowdery how to keep quiet. Uh, he would never allow any man to drag him into a conversation on the subject. And I think he's talking about Mormonism or the uh, Book of Mormon. Okay, and then William Kirby in 1893, he's just postulating this question. I have wondered if Oliver Cowdery had the good fortune to know the bottom facts of the origin of the Book of Mormon. In other words, where it came from, the bottom facts, the very origin of the Book of Mormon, who wrote it, who worked on it, and uh, did people work on it in secret? Okay, a quote here from Tad R. Callister. Uh, he is a true believing Mormon. His book is called A Case for the Book of Mormon, which just came out uh, last year. He says, one candidate for the Book of Mormon authorship was Oliver Cowdery. After all, he was better educated than Joseph Smith. He was a school teacher and would later become a lawyer. All right, so we have a picture here of Tad R. Callister. He speaks in general conference and other occasions for the church. Uh, he says, Oliver was bright, savvy, and shrewd. He was said to have a sound and vigorous intellect and unquestioned legal abilities. So he's a pretty smart guy. Okay, a letter from Joseph Smith to Oliver Cowdery in 1829. You can find this in the Joseph Smith Papers. Uh, he, went, he went on a trip that is Joseph Smith. Uh, he said it was a prosperous journey. Uh, the people were all friendly to us except a few who are in opposition to everything. And two of our most formidable persecutors are now under censure and are cited to a trial in the church uh, for crimes. Cited to a trial in the church for crimes, which if true are worse than all the gold book business. So why does he say that? Is he be, just being kind of honest here? He, he compares uh, formidable persecutors that are under censure and have to go to trial in the church with the gold book business. And he says those are worse than the gold book business. In other words, is he talking about the deception, the fraud, uh, bringing forth the Book of Mormon? All right, a very early newspaper, the Cleveland Herald, uh, the article was called The Golden Bible, came out November 25, 1830, written by John R. St. John. He says, the only opinion that we have of the origin of this Golden Bible is that Mr. Oliver Cowdery and Mr. Joseph Smith, the reputed author, have taken the old Bible to keep up a train of circumstances. So he mentions both of them, both Cowdery and Smith have taken the old Bible to keep up a train of circumstances and by altering names and language have produced the string of jargon called the Book of Mormon with the intention of making money by the sale of their books. So that's interesting. Several people in the early days said that the whole project was to make money, including uh, Emma's father, Isaac Hale. He said the same thing. Okay, Erasmus Turner in the Lockport Balance, 1831, so another very early account. Uh, he says, the founder of Mormonism is Joe Smith, an ignorant and nearly unlettered man living near the village of Palmyra. So he didn't have much formal education. Uh, the second was an itinerant pamphlet peddler 
and occasionally a journeyman printer named Oliver Cowdery. So those were the two guys initially in on the uh, on the Book of Mormon. Okay, Jesse Townsend, a letter to the editor, 1834, so very early still. Uh, Boston Christian Register. Some other men joined Joe in his acts of deception. In that reinforcement was a ready writer by the name of Oliver Cowdery and a Whitney. I'm not sure who the Whitney is. Uh, who assisted Joe in writing the Book of Mormon as a pretended translation of the Golden Plates. The whole was done in the most secret manner. So that's going to be a common thread through these slides as well. That several people said they did it in a secret manner. That is, uh, write or translate the Book of Mormon. And here we have a very good photo of Oliver Cowdery in his suit. Okay, the Reverend John A. Clark, Gleanings by the Way, number seven, the Episcopal Recorder, 1840, still pretty early. As the publication progressed on the Book of Mormon and the contents of the book began to be known, the conviction became general that there was an actor behind the scene moving the machinery of far higher intellectual qualifications than Smith or Harris. Suspicion in some degree rested upon a man by the name of Oliver Cowdery. All right, before I read this one, let's talk a little bit about Solomon Spaulding and his book, Manuscript Found. There's been a lot of conjecture that uh, Sidney Rigdon or Joseph Smith or Oliver Cowdery got a hold of this book, which was a history of the Americas uh, before Columbus. Uh, didn't have too much religious parts in it. It was mainly just a history of the people. But there's a lot of speculation that uh, Rigdon, Smith, and, and Cowdery took this book, Manuscript Found, and turned it into the Book of Mormon by adding the religious parts. Uh, so let's read this. Uh, Tyler Parsons, Mormon Fanaticism Exposed, 1842. I infer that these parts about Christ were added to the original document of Mr. Solomon Spaulding, that's manuscript found, by Joseph Smith, Oliver Cowdery, Rigdon, or some of the fraternity. So one of those guys or all those guys added the religious parts to manuscript found, and that went on to become the Book of Mormon. Uh, in all probability, Oliver Cowdery, Smith, and Rigdon had all more or less to do in combining these additional parts, the religious parts, with Mr. Spalding's work or history. All right, Daniel P. Kidder, Mormonism and the Mormons, 1842. He says, there were at least three parties to the real authorship of the Book of Mormon, three parties. And we think it would be sheer injustice not to put Oliver Cowdery, the schoolmaster, upon as good literary footing as his more ambitious pupil, Joseph Smith, Jr., so since he's a schoolmaster, he's a good writer, probably better than uh, Joseph Smith. It's an injustice not to, to put Oliver Cowdery into the mix as a possible author of the Book of Mormon. All right, Kidder continues. He says, Oliver Cowdery, having been a schoolmaster, it is presumed that his teaching talents found ample scope as well in giving lessons to the author, quote unquote, Notice how he puts the author, quote unquote, uh, as Joseph Smith. Uh, so basically saying, yeah, it probably wasn't Joseph Smith. Uh, giving lessons to the author as in transcribing the book, since Smith's followers assured Mr. Howe that the prophet could not write his own name at the time that he was chosen of the Lord. So insinuating that somebody else must have written it. All right, James H. Hunt here in his book of 1844, talking about how Oliver Cowdery helped to develop the doctrines of the early church. He says, Oliver Cowdery and his associates then began to develop the peculiarities of the new imposition, Mormonism. Imposition is just a deception, but it's inter interesting that he points to Oliver Cowdery as one of these main guys. Okay, Erasmus Turner, History of the Pioneer Settlements of Phelps and Gorham's Purchase, 1851. He says, The Book of Mormon, without a doubt, was a production of the Smith family 
aided by Oliver Cowdery, an intimate friend of the family, and identified with the whole matter. So he thought maybe the Smith family had wrote it, uh, aided by Oliver Cowdery. All right, the historian Erasmus Turner continues. He says, the primitive designs of Miss Lucy Smith, her husband Joseph Sr., and Oliver Cowdery was money-making. So he puts those three together. Joseph Smith's parents and Oliver Cowdery, what was their designs for the Book of Mormon? They wanted to make money. Uh, it was blended with which perhaps was a desire for notoriety to be obtained by a cheat and a fraud. All right, Erasmus Turner continues in his history. He says their son Alva, and he's talking about Alvin, was originally intended or designated by fireside consultations as the forthcoming prophet. So they had picked Alvin initially, he says. The mother and the father said that he was the chosen one, but Alvin died. Thus the world lost a prophet and Mormonism a leader. The mantle of the prophet, which Miss Lucy and Mr. Joseph Smith Sr. and one Oliver Cowdery had wove of themselves every thread of it, fell upon their next eldest son, Joseph Smith Jr. So that's interesting. interesting. He's talking about Joseph Smith's parents and Oliver Cowdery being the ones to decide who is going to be the prophet. And then initially they were talking about Alvin being the prophet. Uh, but it's inter interesting he throws in Oliver Cowdery's name here as one who was had wove of themselves every thread of it, the mantle of the prophet. Interesting. All right, now a quotation from Daniel H. Wells. He's a member of the First Presidency, and he's actually mayor of Salt Lake City. Uh, we're jumping to 1871 now. He said, Oliver Cowdery, an educated person, was of more assistance to Joseph Smith than Sidney Rigdon, for he wrote a good hand and acted as Joseph Smith's secretary, Smith himself being at first illiterate, unable to write, and obliged to confine his correspondence to dictation. So uh, Joseph Smith being fairly illiterate, unable to write, that's why he always had a scribe. Uh, however, Joseph burnished up greatly in the 14 years of his presidency. And burnished up just means he developed. So he became a better writer. He became more literate. He read more, became a better speaker, and he kind of developed into being the prophet and actually took power uh, from Oliver Cowdery and Sidney Rigdon and became the guy. Uh, he says he burnished up uh, in the 14 years of his presidency. Such trials as his would educate almost any man. And this came out uh, in an interview with this uh, Daniel H. Wells in the Cincinnati Commercial, uh, 1871. All right, William E. McClellan, a former apostle of the Mormon Church, the Salt Lake Daily Tribune, 1875. This is an interesting one. And uh, McClellan here is pictured above. It's kind of a rough character. Uh, it says, it was a favorite practice with him, that's Oliver Cowdery, when he was half drunk to preach a Mormon sermon. When visited by any of the saints or a stranger, he invariably asserted the truth of his testimony. But among his friends privately, he admitted that it was all a bottle of smoke. The testimony of, of the truth, I guess, the testimony of the Book of Mormon, the testimony of the Mormon Church, when he got half drunk and when he was amongst his friends privately, he admitted that it was all a bottle of smoke, so he must have known what was going on uh, from the beginning and, and what the process was for coming up with the Book of Mormon. And he probably even wrote some of it. All right. W.H. McIntosh, History of Ontario County, New York, 1876. I've used this source in other videos. Uh, he's talking about uh, Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery here. He says, the general and most probable opinion is that Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery were the authors of the Book of Mormon. You can't get any more direct than that. The general and most probable opinion is that Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery were the authors of the Book of Mormon. 
All right, General Reuben Williams. This is in the Northern Indianian, 1878. He says, Oliver Cowdery was a near neighbor to our family, both of whom then resided in Tiffin, Ohio. So I think this, this is after he left the church, uh, Oliver Cowdery. Uh, and many and vigorous were the discussions between Mr. Oliver Cowdery and the writer's parent, who was Reuben Williams Sr., it is more than probable that Oliver engaged in giving the finishing touches to the Book of Mormon, which it is claimed he wrote for Joseph Smith. All right, Judge William Lang to Thomas Gregg, 1881. Uh, William Lang was Oliver's friend, his colleague. He was actually a law partner uh, and a confidant. This is after uh, Oliver left the, the church, I guess, 1881. Mr. Oliver Cowdery never spoke of his connection with the Mormons to anybody except to me. So he was willing to confide in Judge William Lang. Uh, we were intimate friends. And uh, we're going to talk more about uh, what Judge William Lang said. All right. So this is one of the things that Judge William Lang said about Oliver Cowdery and the Book of Mormon. Uh, this is the history of Seneca County, Ohio, 1880. Oliver Cowdery had more to do with the production of the Mormon Bible than its history had ever given him credit for. He was the best scholar among the leaders. All right, another thing that uh, Judge William Lang said, this is again to Thomas Gregg, 1881. What is claimed to be a translation is the manuscript found worked over by Oliver Cowdery. He was the best scholar among them. I do know, as well as can now be known, that Oliver revised the manuscript and Smith and Rigdon approved of it before it became the Book of Mormon. And we talked a little bit about that manuscript found. He's saying uh, Oliver Cowdery reworked it to uh, turn it into the Book of Mormon. Uh, that manuscript found was uh, written by Solomon Spalding. All right, now we got Thomas Gregg writing to Lorenzo Saunders, 1885. Uh, this can be found in Charles A. Shook book, uh, The True Origin of the Book of Mormon, 1914. Uh, some think that Oliver Cowdery was the medium or the writer of the Book of Mormon. Some think that it was Sidney Rigdon. All right, Lorenzo Saunders, uh, that was Joseph Smith's neighbor, writing back to Thomas Gregg, it's uh, 1885 in the same book. Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon had an intimacy but it was very secret and still. And there was a mediator between them, and that was Oliver Cowdery. So that's another theory that maybe Oliver Cowdery got the manuscript uh, from Solomon Spalding somehow and was able to uh, deliver it uh, to Joseph Smith or Sidney Rigdon. All right, Dr. Wilhelm Ritter von Weimetal, what a name. Joseph Smith, the prophet, his family, and his friends, 1886. He says, Oliver Cowdery and Parley P. Pratt were on the inside of the imposture or the deception from the beginning. Oliver Cowdery and Parley P. Pratt were in on the deception from the beginning. All right, Lorenzo Saunders to Arthur B. Deming, 1887. Remember, Lorenzo is the neighbor of uh, Joseph Smith. And he also knew Oliver Cowdery. So let's read this. I was frequently at the house of Joseph Smith from 1827 to 1830. I saw Oliver Cowdery writing, I suppose, the Book of Mormon with books and manuscripts laying on the table before him. So that's interesting. If, if he was writing the Book of Mormon uh, and he had all these books and manuscripts out before him, that means it wasn't a translation from God. Uh, I went to school with the said Oliver Cowdery, and I know him well. Okay, the book by J.H. Kennedy, Early Days of Mormonism, 1888. Uh, according to this book, Joseph Smith had help in writing the Book of Mormon from Sidney Rigdon and Solomon Spalding. Other help was at hand in the person of Oliver Cowdery, a schoolmaster. These men supplied the literary skill and scholarship that Joseph lacked. People like Oliver Cowdery had the literary and scholarship skill. 
Uh, also, the chief object had in mind by the Smiths in the early days of the gold Bible delusion was the making of money. That was their chief uh, object in mind. All right, Benjamin Winchester pictured above. He was an early convert to the church and a former Mormon. Uh, Salt Lake Daily Tribune, 1889, he says, I believe that the Book of Mormon was mainly the production of the brains of Joseph Smith himself and Oliver Cowdery. Okay, Thomas Gregg, the prophet of Palmyra Mormonism, 1890, says, Our suggestion was to the effect that it may have been Cowdery instead of Rigdon, who somehow obtained the manuscript found, uh, which was the book by Solomon Spaulding, and placed it into the hands of Joseph Smith at the beginning of the deception, and that they too, that is Smith and Cowdery, manipulated it, which is the manuscript found, into the Book of Mormon. They took it, revised it, edited the manuscript found, turned it into the Book of Mormon while pretending to translate. Okay, the same book, Thomas Gregg, he also said, he, Rigdon, and Cowdery had furnished the chief brain supply in fixing up the creed. Okay, Davis H. Bayes, The Doctrines and Dogmas of Mormonism, 1897 now. Uh, he says, all Mormon history and biography agree in connecting Oliver Cowdery, a man the equal of Sidney Rigdon in point of scholastic attainments and personal polish, directly with Joseph Smith in every stage of the development of Mormonism. So Oliver Cowdery, the equal of Sidney Rigdon in scholastic attainments, is connected directly with Joseph Smith in every stage of the development of Mormonism. Yes, uh, you know, the Aaronic priesthood, the Melchizedek priesthood, uh, being a scribe, every step along the way, all the personages that they saw, Oliver Cowdery was with Joseph Smith. So if it was a fraud or deception, Oliver Cowdery should have known about it. All right, the same uh, book here, Davis H. Bayes. He says, the Book of Mormon was created and foisted upon the public by Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery as a new revelation. All right, this is Lee Yost. He's talking to or sending a letter to Diedrich Willers Jr., uh, May 18, 1897. I will give you a short sketch of what I thought of the getting up of the Mormon Bible. At the first, this same Oliver Cowdery taught school in the district before Joe Smith said that he had found the golden plates. And Cowdery was in the habit of staying in the schoolhouse late nights writing about something. No one knew what. Finally, several of the older boys made up their minds to see what the teacher was writing about. Several of them got in the schoolhouse. They got hold of the writings and took them away. Now, my idea of this is that in the first, Cowdery had a good deal to do with the writing of the Book of Mormon. Now, his idea is that Cowdery had a good deal to do with the writing of the Mormon Bible or the Book of Mormon. All right, Reverend S.J.S. Davis the origin of the Book of Mormon, 1899, he says, Oliver Cowdery was a man having more than average abilities. He was a man of good education, an adept in using the pen. So in other words, he was an adept uh, in writing. And he was just the man needed to complete the trio. He's probably talking about Joseph Smith, uh, Sidney Rigdon, and of course, Oliver Cowdery. All right, the same book, Reverend Davis continues. He says, not long after the Book of Mormon made its appearance, many different views of its origin were given. Few people believed the Golden Plate story, and no one thought that Joseph Smith was scholar enough to produce such a work. Rigdon and Cowdery were thought of as the authors, but as Rigdon was then in Ohio, Cowdery was finally conceded to be the author. So that's interesting. All right, another reverend, it's R.B. Neal, a sort of Laban leaflet, early 1900s. He says, Oliver Cowdery was ambitious and something of a scholar, and Joseph Jr., that's Joseph Smith, had to be careful how he sat down on him. So he was probably integral to the bringing forth of the Book of Mormon, and uh, Joseph Smith had to be careful how he kind of scolded him or disciplined him. All right, this is an account from Allison Sherman, uh, mayor of Chicago. Testimony from an unattributed recollection from typeset preserved in the A.B. Deming papers. 
and reprinted in the 1988 uh, Naked Truths About Mormonism newsletter, A.B. Deming. Uh, I'm not going to read through this whole thing. You can you can pause it and read through if you want. It's just talking about the, the idea and the possibility that Oliver Cowdery made some fake golden plates out of copper. And he goes through and talks about the process that it was used. Maybe this happened, and maybe this is what uh, some of the other witnesses saw. Uh, some copper plates, not real gold plates, that Oliver Cowdery had made. All right, let's go to Charles A. Shook's book, The True Origin of the Book of Mormon, 1914. We've got quite a few uh, passages from this book. Uh, Shook says, The Mormon church was not an emanation from the mind of Joseph Smith. It was first conceived of by Sidney Rigdon, and Smith was merely his tool in giving the movement publicity while he played his part behind the scenes until his pretended conversion in the year of 1830. That's Sidney Rigdon. And it is a further conviction that Rigdon and his puppet, Smith, were not the only members of the conspiracy. Associated with them were Hiram Smith, Oliver Cowdery, Parley P. Pratt, and Martin Harris, and probably others. Uh, Martin Harris, I say not. Yeah, he, was, he is probably a dupe. Uh, I also have a video about Hiram Smith's part in producing the Book of Mormon, or maybe he wrote it himself. Also made one about Parley P. Pratt. Maybe he helped write the Book of Mormon as well. Uh, he goes on and he says, and probably others who came in to play their particular roles and to receive in return the honors and the monetary benefits of the Mormon kingdom. And there were monetary benefits. We have other slides about that. Oliver Cowdery had new opportunities to make money and get real estate. So that could have been a motivation uh, for Oliver as well. Uh, each one had his part to play in springing the system upon the world. Rigdon was the theologian, Smith was the prophet or the seer, Cowdery was the scribe or also maybe the writer, one of the writers of the Book of Mormon, uh, Harris the financier, Parley P. Pratt the dreamer, and Orson Pratt his brother the, the, log the logician. Uh, the underlying motives were two, first to make money out of the fraud, that's probably true, and secondly to gratify lust. All right, so Shook continues the same book. It is also believed that Sidney Rigdon communicated with Joseph Smith through their confederates, Oliver Cowdery and Parley P. Pratt. Cowdery first appeared publicly upon the Mormon stage in the year 1829, although we have, although we have every reason to believe that he was secretly playing an important part before. And we're going to go into that. The, uh, the Cowdery families and the Smith families knew each other far before 1829, and we're going to go into a lot of evidence for that on other slides. All right, A. Theodore Schroeder, authorship of the Book of Mormon 1919 now. The Book of Mormon was a collaboration of Sidney Rigdon, Parley P. Pratt, Oliver Cowdery, and perhaps Emma Smith, Hiram Smith, and Joseph Smith, so uh, the Smith family. Uh, I conceive Joseph Smith to have been an ignorant, conscious fraud at first, a mere tool used by more cunning schemers uh, like Rigdon and Pratt and Cowdery. And uh, there was actually a study done on Book of Mormon authorship, a, a word print study. And we'll, we'll go over that on other slides. But they pinpoint uh, authors of the Book of Mormon as Solomon Spaulding, Sidney Rigdon, Parley P. Pratt, Oliver Cowdery, and maybe a few chapters to Joseph Smith. So... This is probably a true statement. All right. Fawn Brody in No Man Knows My History, 1945, said that Oliver had a certain talent for writing. So she admits that. She doesn't think Oliver was the author. She thinks Joseph Smith was the sole author. But anyway, I thought that was kind of interesting. All right. This book here by Robert D. Anderson. He's an MD uh, psychiatrist. This looks like a pretty interesting book. I haven't read the whole thing. It's called Inside the Mind of Joseph Smith, Psychobiography and the Book of Mormon, 1999. Uh, it is my opinion that Cowdery brought with him the overarching conceptual plans and some of the important details that made it possible for Joseph Smith to complete the Book of Mormon. All right, Anderson continues in the same book. Uh, As I read the Book of Mormon, I see Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery constructing narratives of Joseph's personal life within Ethan Smith's conceptual framework. 
if not following the outline of his book, that's Ethan Smith's book, View of the Hebrews, which came out in 1823. And we're going to go more into that, how Oliver probably knew Ethan Smith, how he had a, probably had a copy of the View of the Hebrews, and maybe he gave that uh, to Joseph Smith and they worked on the Book of Mormon together. All right, we have a book here by Kay Burningham, An American Fraud, One Lawyer's Case Against Mormonism, 2011. It's a pretty interesting book. And here is Kay Burningham pictured above at the ex-Mormon conference giving a presentation, a very interesting uh, presentation. You can watch it on YouTube, ex-Mormon Foundation. Uh, she, she says, scholarly historic consensus is that the scripture upon which the religion is based, the Book of Mormon, is a 19th century fiction centered on various alter egos of a disturbed Joseph Smith who it appears acted in collaboration with his third cousin, Oliver Cowdery, and perhaps others. So she, she admits and says that it was a collaboration between Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery. And she's talking about uh, non-Mormon scholarly historic consensus here. All right, so Grant Palmer went on Reddit and was willing to answer questions that people sent in. Uh, this is one of the questions. Uh, it says, I am very curious about who in the very early church was a true believer versus who was in on it. Uh, was Cowdery, Whitmer, Rigdon, or the Smith family, etc. in on it? If you had to guess who knew and who didn't, Grant Palmer responded and said, I think that Oliver Cowdery knew some things. He was the associate president of the church. He was there for, uh, he was there for the priesthood restoration and so forth. He was Joseph Smith's second cousin. So uh, Oliver Cadry knew some things, Grant Palmer said. All right, and here is a picture of Grant Palmer. Uh, he died a couple of years ago. Uh, rest in peace. All right, so we're 35 minutes into this. Uh, believe it or not, that, those were just the introductory statements. This video is going to go for a lot longer, and we're going to go into uh, more details about Cadry's life. Uh, so Oliver Cowdery uh, was born in 1806, died in 1850 at a fairly young age. Uh, he was born in Wells, Vermont. All right, so here is Oliver Cowdery pictured with his wife, Elizabeth Ann Whitmer Cowdery. Uh, it is believed that that was his only wife, that he did not practice polygamy. Uh, Oliver sometimes signed his name as Oliver H. P. Cowdery. And the HP stands for Ervi Pliny. All right, so in the 1835 edition of the Doctrine and Covenants, all the major players had secret uh, names or pseudonyms. Uh, not sure why they were doing this. What, what were they trying to hide? But anyway, Oliver was known as Olaha uh, in this edition of the Doctrine and Covenants. Olaha. Okay, Kathleen Kimball Melanakos' book. We're going to quote from this quite a bit. Uh, Secret Combinations, Evidence of Early Mormon Counterfeiting. Excellent book, which came out about a year or so ago. Uh, Kathleen is pictured above. You can uh, watch her interview on Mormon Stories podcast. Uh, anyway, she says, Oliver's great-grandfather, Nathaniel Cowdery, lived in at least two of the same towns as Solomon Mack, and that is Joseph Smith's grandfather. So, like I said, these two families were intertwined far before 1829. Uh, the towns where they, where they both were presumed to live were uh, Montague, Massachusetts, and East Haddam, uh, Connecticut. All right, so you can pause this and take a look at Oliver Cowdery's genealogy here on this chart if you want. All right, so John L. Brooke in the Refiner's Fire, way back in 1994, uh, identified how these families were intertwined uh, far before um, 1829, uh, which is the official story of the church. Uh, he says two of Nathaniel Cadry's sons had been married in the same church where Solomon Mack married Lydia Gates in 1759. Okay, so Melanakos' book again, uh, talking about the Assail Smith family, that is Joseph Smith's grandfather, uh, they moved to Tunbridge, Vermont in 1791, and Oliver Cadry's brothers Jacob and Jabez already lived there in Tunbridge, Vermont, along with other Cadry spread out in nearby towns. All right, from the website olivercadry.com, 
Uh, this is one of Dale Broadhurst's websites. Uh, he's done more to collect uh, sources about this kind of stuff than anybody. He's collected thousands and thousands of sources from early uh, newspapers, etc. But he says that Lucy Mack, who is Joseph Smith's mother, was also living uh, in the Tunbridge, Vermont area around the same time as, as what we talked about on the last slide, about 1789. So, of course, Lucy Mack uh, is the future wife of Joseph Smith Sr. Uh, she moved to Tunbridge, Vermont to live with her brother Stephen Mack uh, in 1789. And again, from OliverCowdery.com, it says that Lucy Mack married Joseph Smith Sr. in Tunbridge, Vermont. So that's where they got married. Uh, they lived near Oliver Cowdery's great uncle, Dr. Jabez Cowdery. And these facts are also mentioned on Wikipedia, Oliver Cowdery article. Uh, during the 1790s, both Joseph Smith Sr. and Lucy Mack Smith and two of Cowdery's relatives were living in Tunbridge, Vermont. All right, uh, there's Dale Broadhurst here, pictured above, olivercowdery.com again. Uh, I'd like to meet this guy and talk to him because he's just a wealth of information. Uh, I think he lives in Hawaii, so I don't know if I'll be able to get over there to talk to him, but... Uh, he said on December 23, 1805, Joseph Smith Jr. was born to Joseph and Lucy Smith in Sharon, Windsor County, Vermont. Uh, at the same time, Oliver Cadry's grandfather, William Cadry Sr., also lived in Windsor County, Vermont. So th the families lived close to each other. All right, also uh, Wikipedia origin of the Book of Mormon article. Uh, says that Oliver Cowdery was a third cousin of Lucy Mack Smith, which, of course, was uh, Joseph Smith's mother. All right. Cowdery cousins probably attended Joseph Smith Sr. and Lucy Mack's wedding in 1796. So that's interesting. Cousins were probably actually at the wedding. Uh, this is from Melanocles' book again, and also the book Cowdery, Davis, and Vanek, who really wrote the Book of Mormon, 2005. The update to that book is called the Spalding Enigma, and the latest uh, edit or update is 2018. We will go through uh, several things in that book as well. All right, so it looks like Joseph Smith's father and Oliver's father actually knew each other as well. Uh, this is from Dr. D. Michael Quinn's book, Early Mormonism and the Magic Worldview. He says that Joseph Smith Sr. and Oliver's father, William, may have been members of a Congregationalist sect known as the New Israelites, or AKA the Woodscrape Group. Uh, this was organized in Rutland County, Vermont, and we'll go through some more slides on this. And Melanakos also talks about this. Uh, the Woodscrape Group was a front for counterfeiting and radical divining located in Middletown, Vermont. Joseph Smith Sr. and William Cowdery were reported to be members. All right, a little bit more about this group. Uh, Barnes Frisbee, The History of Middletown, Vermont, 1867. Justice Winchell was also another member of the group. Uh, Winchell stayed at the home of Mr. William Cowdery in Wells, Vermont. William was the father of Oliver Cowdery, of course, uh, the noted Mormon. Winchell, I have been told, was a friend and acquaintance of the Cowdery's. Uh, they were intimate afterwards. All right, another history here by H.P. Smith and W.H. Ran, The History of Rutland County, 1866. Uh, Winchell got people in Middletown, Vermont, to dig for buried treasure using the hazel rod. That's, that's what Oliver Cadre used, too. He had a divining rod, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, and Winchell went to the house of Mr. Cowdery and stayed there for some time, becoming intimate with that family. Mr. Cowdery was the father of Oliver Cowdery, who later became a noted Mormon. So just keep this in mind. It'll all fit together in a minute. All right, the historian Barnes Frisbee again. He interviewed 30 people about this kind of stuff. Uh, Frisbee says, There we find these men, Joseph Smith Sr. and William Cowdery with the counterfeiter Winchell, searching for money over the hills and mountains with the hazel rod, and their sons Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery as soon as they were old enough, were in the same business. All right, so Quinn also talks about this in his book. He says, Residents of Middletown, Rutland County, Vermont, claim that a man named Winchell was involved with the William Cowdery and Joseph Smith families in the Vermont Woodscrape Group. 
Winchell was the first man who used the hazel rod sometime in the year 1799. He first went to a Mr. Cowdery in Wells, the father of Oliver Cowdery, the noted Mormon, and soon Winchell made the acquaintance of the Woods. The Woods group got its name after the Woods. And they then commenced using the hazel rod and digging for money, which was in the spring or early in the summer of 1800. I have been told that Joe Smith's father resided in Pulteney, Vermont at the time of the wood movement there. Uh, that's the wood scrape movement uh, here. And that he was in it. That's uh, Joe Smith's father. And he was one of the leading rodsmen. So maybe this Winchell guy is the one who taught Oliver Cowdery uh, because in his youth, Oliver hunted for buried treasure using a divining rod as pictured above. Uh, one source for this is Dan Vogel Early Mormon Documents. And Grant Palmer talks about this in his book, An Insider's View of Mormon Origins. Uh, Oliver was a treasure hunter and a rodsman before he met Joseph Smith. Okay, there's also a revelation given to Oliver Cowdery in April 1829 about using this rod. Uh, Book of Commandments uh, 7, uh, verse 3. This was changed quite a bit in the 1835 edition of the Doctrine and Covenants. We can go to the Book of Commandments and read this. Uh, now this is not all, for you have another gift. He's talking to Oliver Cowdery which is the gift of working with the rod, like we, picture, like we saw in the picture uh, previously. Behold, it has told you things. Behold, there is no other power save God that can cause this rod of nature to work in your hands, for it is the work of God, and therefore whatsoever you shall ask me to tell you by that means, or by the rod, that will I grant unto you that you shall know. Okay, a letter from Oliver Cowdery to W.W. W. Phelps uh, talks about uh, searching for treasure. Oliver talks about being employed by Josiah Stoll in digging for Spanish treasure on his property. This would have been about 1825 or 1826. All right, so why do we go through all these sources? Well, it is to show that the official uh, story, the official history of the Mormon church is bogus. The Cowdery and Smith families knew each other far before 1829. You have to ask yourself, what is the church trying to hide? Uh, again, John L. Brook talks about this in Refiner's Fire all the way back into 1994. He says, as Mormon historians rarely note, so basically they're trying to keep it under wraps, uh, this was not a chance relationship. That is the relationship between Joseph and Oliver but it was an old connection running back to Pulteney and Tunbridge, Vermont, and to East Haddam, Connecticut. Okay, from OliverCowdery.com again, he says, In the spring of 1825, revival meetings were held near Palmyra, Wayne, New York. It is likely that Oliver Cowdery and his cousin Joseph Smith Jr. both attended some of these meetings. Notice this is four years before they were supposed to have met. All right, so the first passage here from the Spalding Enigma book, a very important book with a lot of detailed research, uh, says, In the spring of 1822, Oliver was in Palmyra, New York, confabulating with his cousins, the Smiths, and most likely Justice Winchell, who we already talked about, and Lumen Walters, who was kind of a uh, treasure-digging uh, teacher to Joseph Smith. Uh, it is likely that uh, Oliver stayed with the Smiths while visiting. All right, so a little bit about Oliver's education. Uh, in the winter of 1813, Oliver probably started attending school in Pulteney, Vermont. And evidence from his later life indicates that Oliver was likely an attentive and capable student who remained in school until his education was well advanced. And again, an account in the Paul and Parks book, History of Wells, Vermont, 1869. We well remember the same Oliver Cowdery when in our boyhood, he attended school in the district we reside in in 1821 and 1822. And then he then went to Palmyra, New York. So that's interesting. He's attending school in 1821 and 1822. Then he went to Palmyra. This is very early on. And then in the Spalding Enigma book, uh, it also seems probable that Oliver's brothers Dyer and Lyman were also with him in Palmyra. 
over the next couple of months now this remember this is about 1822 over the next couple of months Oliver participated with the Smiths and others in their money digging operations and engaged in numerous fireside consultations concerning the future fortunes of the family all right from the Spalding Enigma book again eight in 1825 or 1826 Oliver probably taught school in Fayette New York some of David Whitmer's children probably went to this school so they probably knew each other beforehand as well uh, David was one of the three witnesses to the Book of Mormon of course Oliver may have boarded with the Whitmers as well so from the same book here around 1827 Sidney Rigdon and Oliver Cowdery went to Ohio together in order to spend a few months reworking the Book of Mormon manuscript and preparing it for publication so they're they're postulating that they worked on it together and then returned to Palmyra in September in time for Joseph Smith to discover the book quote unquote Oliver and Sidney knew that their roles in the coming forth of the Book of Mormon would be kept secret until the book was published at which time both of them would publicly endorse it and uh, Richard Lloyd Anderson says that Oliver came from a New England family with strong traditions of learning and religion all right Larry E Morris BYU studies 2000 Oliver's father William Cowdery was a literate man who emphasized his children's education at least four of his six sons became either doctors or lawyers and we know that Oliver Cowdery became a lawyer all right the same source here uh, Oliver probably learned composition figures and reading including the Bible and uh, this is Larry E Morris pictured above he also has another book entitled a documentary history of the Book of Mormon of course he leaves out uh, most of these sources that we're going through in this video and all the way back in 1830 uh, the Cleveland Herald had the following to say uh, as a young adult Oliver found work peddling books in New York and Canada uh, he also wrote and printed pamphlets and Oliver had more of a formal education than Joseph Smith according to Wikipedia all right Richard Van Wagner uh, RIP uh, his book is Sidney Rigdon a portrait of religious success 1994 uh, Richard says Oliver was considerably better schooled than his prophet cousin Joseph Smith so it's interesting he had was considerably better schooled than Joseph Smith so let's get into the view of the Hebrews a little more here Ethan Smith a pastor who lived near Oliver in Pulteney Vermont wrote the book view of the Hebrews in 1823 a couple years later there was a revision of it uh, it is a work that has been posited as a source for the Book of Mormon this according to Wikipedia and again from Wikipedia Oliver and his family attended Ethan Smith's church starting in November of 1821 okay we then have David Persowitz book not sure how you say his name uh, Joseph Smith and the origins of the Book of Mormon which came out in 2000 based on baptism records it is reasonable to expect that Oliver Cowdery eventually became acquainted firsthand with Ethan Smith all right on August 2nd 1818 William jr. that's Oliver's father and Keziah's uh, three daughters were baptized in the Pulteney Congregational Church uh, the same church that Ethan Smith took over in 1821 so that's uh, Oliver's parents Oliver's father and Oliver's stepmother their three daughters were baptized in the Pulteney Congregational Church the same church Ethan Smith took over a couple years later and again from Persowitz book uh, Oliver surely had a copy of the view of the Hebrews all right Thomas Stewart Ferguson the famous uh, amateur archaeologist for the Mormon Church uh, in a letter he said the Cowdery family had a close tie with Ethan Smith and back to Richard Van Wagner's book uh, Oliver may have been employed by Smith and shoot the Pulteney Vermont firm that printed view of the Hebrews that's interesting he may have been employed by the printer that printed the book view of the Hebrews and you can watch my other video about all the similarities between the view of the Hebrews and the Book of Mormon there's a lot of conceptual ideas there's a very good chance that uh, whoever wrote the Book of Mormon knew about view of the Hebrews uh, Oliver may have also been a traveling agent for this printer the printer that, that printed view of the Hebrews 
All right, the same book. It has two different covers. Uh, Oliver had copies of the 1823 edition of View of the Hebrews in his knapsack when he visited his relatives, the Smiths. All right, a little bit about his career. Oliver was also a shop assistant and a salesman for a printing company. Oliver was a school teacher in Manchester, New York. He started his teaching as early as 1825. All right, in 1830, the William Cowdery family were living in Arcadia, just east of Palmyra. So 1830, uh, the year when the Book of Mormon was published, uh, William Cowdery, that's, jo that's uh, Oliver Cowdery's father, were living just east of Palmyra. Interesting, this goes back to the Refiner's Fire book. And, of course, Oliver was the chief scribe for the Book of Mormon after Martin Harris lost 116 pages. All right, a few slides here about the curtain that was between them. The use of the curtain must be regarded only as a dramatic accessory for the purpose of duping Harris. And as Cowdery was beyond question in the confidence of Smith, it is reasonable to suppose that this mysterious method of work, in other words, the curtain, was by no means employed when the accomplices were by themselves, because they were both in on it. Uh, according to J.H. Kennedy, Early Days of Mormonism. A uh, similar comment in the Spalding Enigma. When Joseph Smith dictated the text to Martin Harris, there was a blanket between them. When he dictated to Oliver Cowdery, they took the blanket down. Was Cowdery already in on the scheme? All right, Richard Bushman, the historian, uh, pictured above, rough stone rolling, says the same thing. When Martin Harris had taken dictation from Joseph, they had first hung a blanket between them. By the time that Cowdery arrived, translator and scribe were no longer separated. All right, something that Francis W. Kirkham pointed out in 1941 in the Improvement Era Smith and Harris only transcribed 116 pages in two months. When Oliver Cowdery arrived, they finished 600 pages in only 75 days. So the rate of transcription really went up. Why was that? Okay, a statement from Oliver Cowdery. I wrote with my own pen the entire Book of Mormon, save a few pages, as it fell from the lips of the prophet Joseph Smith. Sidney Rigdon did not write it. Mr. Spalding did not write it. I wrote it myself as it fell from the lips of the prophet. And then a comment from mormonthink.com on the Mo uh, Book of Mormon authorship page. It is as if Oliver were guardedly asserting that he was largely responsible for the final form of the Book of Mormon. And Oliver recopied the entire Book of Mormon manuscript for the printer. Uh, this document was recently purchased, I believe, from the reorganized church uh, by the LDS church for $35 million. Uh, it is also said that Oliver set some of the type for the first edition of the Book of Mormon, uh, according to Richard Bushman. And, of course, we know that Oliver was one of the three witnesses to the Book of Mormon Golden Plates. The other was uh, David Whitmer and Martin Harris. Oliver supposedly saw the angel Moroni on June 25th, 1829. And Oliver had a vision where the Lord appeared to him and showed him the golden plates. Oliver supervised the printing of the Book of Mormon. Oliver Cowdery is alleged to have provided the initial editing of the Book of Mormon before publication. And Wikipedia also says those who doubt the miraculous origin theory of the Book of Mormon have speculated that Cowdery may have played a role in the work's composition. Uh, it's interesting, in 1830, Joseph Smith gave Oliver his brown seer stone, which he kept until his death, and then I guess it was returned to the church. And Oliver and Joseph received the Aaronic priesthood from the resurrected John the Baptist on May 15, 1829, just one of the heavenly visitations that they received. Oliver was the first baptized Latter-day Saint. Oliver gave the first public discourse after the church was organized on April 6, 1830. He gave the first public discourse, uh, pictured above Billy Graham speaking. Uh, Richard Lloyd Anderson again, Encyclopedia of Mormonism. Few people exceeded Oliver in logical argument and elevated style. 
And it is interesting to note that Oliver may have been a scribe for the famous Mason William Morgan as well. Uh, William Morgan was the author of the expose Illustrations of Masonry, 1826, where, where he exposed some of the secrets of the Masons. Uh, William Bryant said that he, Cowdery, was strong against the Masons. Uh, he helped to write Morgan's book, they said. That is, Oliver Cowdery helped to write Morgan's book. Uh, you can find that statement in the Will William Kelly notes. And, of course, Oliver and Joseph also received the Melchizedek priesthood from the New Testament apostles Peter, James, and John. Uh, this was supposedly soon after May 15, 1829, uh, but there is no accurate date for this. And Oliver wrote the first history of the church in 1835. Uh, Joseph Smith had wanted him, to, wanted him to do that. But Oliver left out details of his own history prior to 1828, which we have covered in this video. All right. Oliver and Joseph supposedly saw Jesus, Moses, Elias, and Elijah in the Kirtland Temple on April 3rd, 1836. Uh, these beings uh, appeared to them in order to accept the new building and confer priesthood keys. That's what the Mormon Church says. All these events of heavenly personages. Was Oliver Cowdery, Oliver Cowdery really deceived and just saw them in his mind's eye? Or was he in on the whole scam from the beginning? I think he was in on it. So on April 6, 1830, Oliver was recognized as the church's second elder next to Joseph Smith. He was second in authority for the next eight years, uh, DNC 23. And it is also interesting to note that in 1830, Oliver served as a scribe for the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. So not just the Book of Mormon, but also the Bible, the majority of which the Mormon church does not use. And I don't know why that's the case. It's supposed to be an inspired translation of the Bible, and the church only uses a small part of it. Okay, it's interesting to note that also Oliver served as church historian and recorder, uh, both in 1830 and in 1835. Uh, this according to Leonard Arrington in BYU Studies. Oliver was also one of the first Latter-day Saint apostles, but as assistant president of the church and also the second elder, he had authority above the apostles. As an indication of that, in February 1835, Oliver officiated in the selection, instruction, and ordination of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, so of course he was above them. And beginning in 1834, Oliver was the editor of the Latter-day Saints Messenger and Advocate, and also the Evening and Morning Star, uh, which were both early church newspapers in Missouri and Ohio. All right, Richard Lloyd Anderson again. Uh, he says, Oliver wrote with unusual consistency through two decades of published writings and personal letters. And minutes and letters picture Oliver as a highly effective preacher and a highly effective writer and an administrator. And from 1834 to 1838, Oliver was the assistant president of the church, that is, second in command to Joseph Smith. Uh, Oliver, Oliver left the church, and we'll go into a little bit of that later, uh, and Hiram Smith became the assistant president of the church. Oliver was a stockholder and a director in the Kirtland Safety Society Bank, or anti-bank, uh, where Oliver lost most of his money, something that really uh, made him mad. You'll notice here uh, that where it says president on this Kirtland Bank uh, Society note says Sidney Rigdon is the president. That's interesting. And then Joseph Smith uh, is signed where it says cash. So that's kind of interesting. Another interesting tidbit in 1837, Oliver was president of the Bank of Monroe in Michigan. Uh, you can read about that in Quinn's book, uh, Wealth and Corporate Power. Uh, in the same book, uh, from 1836 to 1838, Oliver was a partner in the merchandising company, Cahoon, Carter, and Company. So, you know, once they created the church, there was a lot of merchandising and real estate opportunities for both Joseph and Oliver. They were able to uh, get the church to build them homes, etc., printing uh, facilities. 
And from this same book, D. Michael Quinn, The Mormon Hierarchy, uh, Wealth and Corporate Power, just came out a couple years ago. Oliver had an interest or was a partner in all of the following businesses. Uh, printing company, F.G. Williams & Company. Uh, Far West Temple Committee Store. Uh, Kirtland Ashery, a fertilizer company. He had an interest in the Kirtland Board Kiln Lumber Company. Uh, Kirtland Brickyard and Kiln Brick and Cement Company. Kirtland Steam Milk Lumber Company. Peter French Farm. Peter French Tavern and Public House. That's interesting. The, the church had a tavern, I guess. Or Oliver Cowdery had an interest in a tavern. Uh, an interest in the Kirtland Tannery and the Newell K. Whitney and Company Merchandising Company, the United Firm of Kirtland Merchandising Company, and a partner in Rigdon, Smith, Cadre and Company, another merchandising company. So there was a lot of opportunities to get some income from all these companies, whether he was a director or a partner or whatever, that Oliver Cadre never had before the church was established. All right, uh, Dean C. Jesse in the Papers of Joseph Smith. In December 1834, Oliver ranked above Sidney Rigdon to officiate in the absence of Joseph Smith. Okay, in 1834, Oliver was a member of the first presiding high council in Kirtland, Ohio. Uh, not sure what they did. Uh, it is interesting to note that Oliver was instrumental in converting the minister Sidney Rigdon. Uh, Oliver baptized him. Now that's assuming that they didn't know each other beforehand. They probably did. They're probably reworking the Solomon Spalding manuscript. And I'm going to do a big, long video about that whole possibility. And also, Oliver baptized Parley P. Pratt in the Seneca Lake on September 1st, 1830. So he baptized both key members, Sidney Rigdon and Parley P. Pratt. That's kind of interesting. And Oliver also helped Joseph Smith publish a series of revelations first called the Book of Commandments, and later revised and expanded into the, into the Doctrine and Covenants. And the Mormon Church acknowledges that many sections of the Doctrine and Covenants were revealed jointly to Smith and Cowdery. Uh, these sections that were revealed jointly are 6, 7, 13, 18, 24, 26, and 110. Uh, this according to uh, reassessing authorship of the Book of Mormon. Uh, literary and linguistic computing. All right, Thomas G. Alexander, pictured above, Sunstone Magazine, 1980. Currently available evidence indicates that members of the First Presidency, uh, particularly Joseph Smith, Oliver Cowdery, Frederick G. Williams, and Sidney Rigdon, were the principal persons involved in doctrinal development prior to 1835. In 1837, Oliver was elected Justice of the Peace in Kirtland. So let's talk about an article that came out in a scholarly journal. Uh, it was the Journal of the Association for Literary and Linguistic Computing. Peer-reviewed uh, journal and article here, December 2008. It was by Jockers, Witten, and Criddle, reassessing the authorship of the Book of Mormon. Okay, so like a fingerprint, your writing style, your frequency of use of commonly used words can act as an identifier of who you are. Everybody has their own writing style, and this study actually evaluates that and who may have written the Book of Mormon. It said, we offer an approach that employs two classification techniques. Uh, one is a delta, which is commonly used to determine probable authorship, and the other is the nearest shrunken centroid model, or NSC, a more generally applicable classifier. We use both methods to determine on a chapter-by-chapter -chapter basis the probability that each of seven potential authors wrote or contributed to the Book of Mormon. Okay, so Oliver Cowdery's style of writing, his word print, his use of commonly used words, frequency, etc. Uh, this is a chart here, chapter by chapter, probability of Oliver Cowdery as author for those chapters. Uh, seven author case. So you can look at these black bars. In those chapters of the Book of Mormon, 
Oliver Cowdery is the most likely author. And here's another chart. It's showing basically the same thing. Uh, the yellow bars are Cowdery, uh, Book of Mormon Authorship Attribution, using the 1830 text and modern chapter divisions. Uh, so yeah, the yellow bars, those chapters most likely written by Cowdery. All right, so here's another chart. Uh, chapters for which the first place NSC assignment was Cowdery, uh, five author case. So here's a different uh, bar graph showing these black bars. Uh, first place assignment for Cowdery. So Cowdery's signal shows up strongest in the third quarter of the Book of Alma. Uh, these are well-composed chapters that deal with such topics as the nature of faith, uh, the atonement through Christ and liberty. So this is the same study, uh, literary and linguistic computing, uh, 2008. Okay, another interesting statement here in the study. Uh, Alma 36 is a chiasm. Uh, this chiasm occurred by design. According to John W. Welch, he's a BYU professor, uh, publications in the New England area describing the use of chiasmus as a biblical literary form were available for purchase in bookshops or from traveling salesmen in 1825. And as we know, Oliver sold books as a traveling salesman. So if this chapter really is uh, written by Oliver Cowdery, as the study seems to indicate, uh, it seems to show that Oliver Cowdery knew about chiasm or chiasmus. The biblical literary form. We'll, we'll talk about what it is on the next few slides. So this is what a simple chiasm looks like. You have the green bar in the middle and then it starts to branch off and says basically the same thing on both sides. So the day of power, the day of wrath, and then you look in the, the tan bar. He is sent to conquer. He goes out to conquer. Then the pink bar, uh, Yahweh establishes the king. Yahweh establishes the king. So it says this branching out structure where they repeat things, uh, which is found in Hebrew writings, you know, uh, biblical writings, and it's also found in the Book of Mormon. So it shows a little bit of sophistication in writing the Book of Mormon, uh, although we knew we know that there was pamphlets and books about this uh, in 1825, as we showed on the last slide. So Oliver Cowdery could have uh, could have found out about this and read about it and put it into the Book of Mormon. Was Joseph Smith sophisticated enough to use chiasm? I probably, I don't think so. I, I think probably not, but maybe Oliver Cowdery and Sidney Rigdon were, or even Solomon Spaulding. So that's uh, kind of interesting. All right, so here's Alma 36 again. It's a pretty large branching out chiasmus here in Alma 36. It shows a level of sophistication. Somebody that knew about these these Hebrew biblical chiasms. So was Joseph Smith sophisticated at that young of an age to know how to do this? Probably not. I think this had to be somebody a little more sophisticated, maybe somebody a little bit older like uh, Sidney Rigdon or um, had more education like Oliver Cowdery. All right, so here's another look at the same chiasmus. Pretty large and branching off here. Um, you know, some degree of sophistication. Also, there was an article by uh, Corbin Valuz in BYU Studies talking about numerology and the number seven. There's some pretty sophisticated use of numerology in the Book of Mormon as well that shows a level of sophistication, uh, something that a person like uh, Sidney Rigdon or Solomon Spaulding would have known about. For more information about the research methods of this study and seven long slideshows about who wrote the Book of Mormon, Go to Dr. Craig Criddle's site, mormonleaks.com, not I-O, it's mormonleaks.com. Uh, Craig Criddle is a professor of environmental engineering and science. He's a very smart guy. Uh, he's a professor at Stanford University. Uh, Matthew L. Jockers is also at Stanford University. Uh, he is a lecturer and an academic technology specialist in the Department of English at Stanford University. His research involves computer-based approaches to the study of large collections of literature. All right, so in 1838, Oliver Cowdery was excommunicated from the church. Uh, this was in part for his criticism of Joseph Smith 
uh, for Joseph Smith's affair with a Smith maid, Fanny Alger. It was a maid living in their house. And Joseph Smith married her and, and had sex with her. So that was a pretty big scandal for Oliver. So uh, Fanny Alger was only 16 years old. So you could make the argument that it was child molestation as well on Joseph Smith's part. Uh, Oliver Cowdery called the affair dirty, nasty, and filthy. Uh, this is a letter from Oliver to his brother Warren on January 1838. All right, from the mormoncurtain.com, there was an interesting statement here by somebody named Mithrin. Uh, what does the Spalding Rigdon timeline mean? Uh, he says, when Oliver leaves the church, Sidney gives a speech telling the saints to kill those who leave. So that's kind of scary. Uh, this is significant because prior to this, a lot of people left the church, but no one said they should be murdered. This speech causes the Governor Boggs extermination order that drives the Mormons from Missouri. A whole host of people are excommunicated in the early days, but Rigdon and Smith are far more upset when Oliver Cowdery leaves. So I think this is one of the reasons why Oliver kept his mouth shut. Yeah, he, he was an ambitious guy and, and didn't want to admit to his fraud and he wanted to... Uh, to work as a lawyer, you know, and didn't want to admit to his past follies. But I think he was also scared for his life. Uh, he was, he, they probably took secret oaths, secret blood oaths, when they came up with this whole plan of writing the Book of Mormon. And they probably agreed, similar to what used to be in the temple, a blood oath that if you ever reveal what happened, we will kill you basically. <laughs> and this statement just kind of talks about that a little bit. I think Oliver was probably pretty scared that the Danites would come after him and, you know, they could kill him. So after the excommunication uh, for the next seven years, Oliver practiced law in Ohio. Oliver was characterized as an able lawyer, well-informed, with brilliant speaking ability. He's a smart guy. All right, going back to Oliver Cowdery's law partner, William Lang, history of Seneca County again. Uh, Oliver's addresses to the court and jury were characterized by a high order of oratory with brilliant and forensic force. So that's his law partner saying that uh, he, he was a very able speaker, high order of oratory with brilliant and forensic force, a smart guy. Uh, again, one of the famous orators is... Uh, Winston Churchill, pictured above here. Uh, another interesting fact here from the Spalding Enigma, around 1826 or 1827, Oliver probably became a Mason with his brother Warren at the Olive Branch Lodge number 215 at Bethany, New York. And it is known that in 1847, Oliver became a founding member of the Harmony Masonic Lodge number 12 in Elkhorn, uh, Wisconsin. He was listed as a senior deacon, and only Master Masons could be founding members. So we, we know that Oliver Cowdery became a Master Mason in 1847. Uh, this is after he was excommunicated. Uh, it looked like he was a Mason before he joined the Mormons. Uh, this is from Proceedings of a Grand Annual Communication of the Grand Lodge of Wisconsin, begun and held at Madison, Wisconsin, 1848. And Oliver became an editor of the Seneca Advertiser in Tiffin, Ohio, uh, for about five years between 1842 and 1847. Oliver became a civic and political leader, joined the Methodist Church, and served as a secretary in 1844. Uh, in 1846, Oliver was nominated as his district's Democratic Party candidate for the state Senate, uh, but he was defeated. Uh, you can read about this in the book Second Elder and Scribe uh, by Stanley R. Gunn, 1962. In 1847, Oliver practiced law in Wisconsin. This is uh, Wikipedia. And around this time, Oliver became the co-editor of the Walworth County Democrat in Wisconsin. Again, Wikipedia. So he continued to write and in 1848, Oliver ran for state assemblyman, but he was defeated. 
1848, Oliver was rebaptized into the church uh, in Iowa. Not sure why he wanted to come back. Uh, Oliver then began practicing law in Ohio. Uh, this is from Eber D. Howe's Mormonism Unveiled. Uh, it's interesting to note, if you look at the title page on Mormonism Unveiled, the Eber D. Howe book, there's a part on there that says the Golden Bible was brought before the world to which are added inquiries into the probability that the historical part of the said Bible was written by one Solomon Spalding more than 20 years ago and by him intended to have been published as a romance. So right on the title page, they're talking about Solomon Spalding being the author. So that's pretty interesting. And Oliver Cowdery had health problems actually for most of his life. Uh, it was probably tuberculosis, which I think he got from his mother. Uh, Oliver Cowdery died on March 3rd, 1850 in Richmond, Missouri at the young age of 43. That's too bad. And that's it. Uh, the next one in the Book of Mormon series here that I'm doing is going to be on Sidney Rigdon and how maybe he altered the Solomon Spalding uh, manuscript found. So that's going to be a nice long one. A lot of information to go through. So it's it's going to take a few weeks to compile all that information. But that'll be the next one. But that's going to do it for this video. And I thank you for watching the Did Oliver Cadre Write the Book of Mormon video.